Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, well, I just want to thank Pastor for that wonderful introduction. And we are here each night. We would like to share a little health nugget, something that you can take home with you that can help you to keep well. And we believe that one of the best things that we can do for our bodies and our minds is to eat foods that will nourish them and that will build up our cells. And as you can see, we have a wonderful spread in front of us here. Um, nothing in a box, <laughs> nothing in a can. We want to eat the majority of the things that we like um, comes from the ground. So we have good broccoli and peppers and grapes and all kinds of good stuff. And so today we want to share with you something that I think is very prevalent because we are in, um, or we might just be passing the flu season. I think we're kind of still in the flu season. And many of us have either um, had the flu or family members had the flu or you know someone that has a flu and it's just not a pleasurable time. And we want to show a simple recipe that you can make that when you feel the symptoms coming on, you know, you wake up with a sore throat and you just start to feel kind of lousy, that is the time that you really want to kind of attack it before it gets full blown. And so we have a really quick um, recipe that I think you all will enjoy. And we call it Nature's flu shot. Let's see if this works here. Okay, here we go. All right, well, it's not going to be this here. <laughs> we want to stay away from that as much as possible, but um, just some quick facts on the actual flu shot. You know, we were going to the store today and they had signs all over get your flu shot today, get your flu shot today. And here's something that I think um, you would find interesting. So we found that some of the side effects of the conventional flu shot um, is mild fever, muscle aches, nausea, headaches, um, fainting, mainly adolescents, soreness, redness, or swelling at the injection site. Um, if you actually had the flu shot, you may have experienced some of these symptoms. Um, runny nose or congestion. Um, and in some cases, the flu itself. So here it is that we take something to combat the flu and we end up getting the flu. So um, it's kind of funny how that works. But we want to show you something that um, is very simple and you probably already have all of the ingredients in your home, in your kitchen. And all you need is a blender. Very simple recipe. And it's here on the screen for those who would like to um, take a, a picture of it or you can write it down. Um, essentially, we want to peel a whole bulb of garlic. So it's about 20 pieces of the garlic. So it's not just one piece, it's a whole bulb. So you need the whole bulb of garlic. And of course, you know, bowl, uh, garlic um, has a host of um, nutritive properties. Um, it is antiviral, antibacterial, and it's just a wonderful um, thing to have around and, and uh, to keep in your diet on a consistent basis to kind of ward off any kind of virus or bacteria or anything that might be kind of lurking in the system. So we're just going to put a bulb of garlic, about 20 pieces. And we need one cup of fresh lemon juice. We've already squeezed um, some lemons here. And you definitely want to use the fresh lemon and not the one that's already in the bottle. Some of those have um, preservatives and other uh, ingredients in there that um, don't contain all of the nutritional value once it's fresh. So I'm just going to put a whole cup of about a cup fresh lemon juice all right next we're gonna have two teaspoons of ginger powder or fresh ginger I actually prefer everything fresh so we got some ginger here that we picked up and I've already peeled the ginger so we're gonna put some fresh ginger slices in here 
Okay. Then we're going to add an eighth teaspoon of cayenne pepper. Well, I should back up and say ginger um, has a really nice warming effect on the body, and it, it's also very good um, for several things. Of course, those uh, you, of you may know if you have a little stomach ache or something going on in the digestive tract, ginger is really good to kind of soothe that. Um, and so ginger will give this nature flu shot okay, um, some of those properties that will help the body in healing. And we just need an eighth of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper. Cayenne pepper kind of acts as a, um, a catalyst, I guess, if you will, in the system. It kind of um, moves things along. It, it's um, definitely hot, so you don't need too much, but it will help to um, kind of ward off some of those things that's going on in the body, kind of heat it up a little bit, and get rid of whatever is lurking there. All right, and uh, one tablespoon of honey. Just gonna squeeze a tablespoon of honey in here. This is just plain organic honey. Any honey will do. Um, honey has a wonderful um, effect on the body. It's, it's very healing, both topically and also internally. Um, sometimes if you get a burn or if you have something, you can actually rub a little bit of honey on it and it actually helps with healing as well. And internally, it's um, very nutritious. Then we're going to add three cups of pineapple juice. This is 100% pineapple juice, so it's not mixed with any other juice, and it's not from concentrate. And the pineapples, of course, you can actually just cut up a pineapple, put it in there, but we, I guess if you feel, you don't feel up to it, it's kind of a lot of work to cut over a pineapple and so on. So the pineapple juice works just as well. Pineapples actually have a um, property... Um, called bromelain that is an anti-inflammatory. And so you find in regards to the body, some of the times when we feel sick, it's because there's a lot of inflammation going on in, in the system. And so when you take things that are anti-inflammatory, like uh, ginger and pineapple, that kind of helps the body to, to overcome. Very simple recipe here, and all you do is just blend it. You can also add a little bit of turmeric, too. If you have some turmeric at home, the little yellow golden-looking powder, not the curry powder, the turmeric just by itself. And turmeric is also a very good anti-inflammatory agent as well. So you can also add about, I'd say, about a half a teaspoon or so of turmeric, and that would also boost this flu shot up a bit. You may want to turn down the mic a little so it's not too loud. This makes about a quart of um, flu shot, and you can just, you know, keep it in a mason jar, some kind of airtight jar, glass jar. You can just keep it in the refrigerator and take about a half a cup or so anytime you kind of feel some symptoms coming on. Um, we normally just like to make it once someone in our home is starting to feel a little bit under the weather. We start taking it right at that point, and it lasts, I would say, a couple of days or so, about two, three days, maybe tops, if you're taking it continually. But um, no side effects here. <laughs> and um, I think if you try it, you will enjoy it. It actually has a very pleasant taste as well. So I had a friend who actually would just drink as, as a regular drink. And I, anyway, I just thought that was very funny. We do have samples available for those who would like to try it after the end of the meetings. So we're gonna now turn this over to our next meeting uh, presenter, and I thank you for your time. Say good evening to everyone. We also want to welcome you.
to the Abundant Life Health Seminar. Just out of curiosity, how many of us are here at this church for the very first time? You're visiting here for the very first time. Praise God. God bless. Good to see you guys. Wonderful to have you. Um, my name is Norlin Edwards, and I'll be a speaker for the next four weekends, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, three sessions on Saturdays. And um, this particular weekend, the first weekend, is focused exclusively and particularly on health. And it was revolutionary a few years back when I learned that God not only cares about our spirituality, but God is also a practical, real, father-like figure. He actually cares about our health and our well-being. So you're going to find that as we go through this week, we're going to see in the Bible that God literally cares about every aspect of our lives. He cares about our mental, He cares about our physical, and He also cares about our spiritual. Amen? All right, our first message tonight is entitled, None of These Diseases. And I like, I like a responsive audience. What's our subject? None of these diseases. Now, you'll find that this is a wonderful promise that God has given us in His Word. And even though it was spoken directly to a specific people at that time, you're going to find that that same promise that God made to that group of people is also applicable to us as we're living in these last days. Before we begin, um, if you have a cell phone, just make sure it's silent or vibrate or off. We just want to make sure that we don't have any unnecessary distractions. And with that said, I'm going to offer a word of prayer, and then we're going to get right into tonight's subject, none of these diseases. Bow your heads with me. Father, thank you so much that you love us so much and care so much about us even our physical well-being. And we pray, Lord, that as we go through the series of health lectures, that someone's life may be transformed for time and for eternity. We commit it to you. I pray that as you have chosen me to present before your people, that you give me clarity. I pray that you will allow the words, words to be spoken with such clarity that it may be irrefutable. But most importantly, I pray that it will be received into our hearts, applied into our lives, that our lives may be transformed and that we may begin to have the health that you so desire. I thank you so much in advance, Lord. Bless us now. Send angels to be with us and to impress these words on our minds and our hearts and also to waste away any dark forces that tries to interfere with what you desire to share with us this evening. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Again, our subject is none of these diseases. In the book of Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 3, the Bible says, a prudent man, that word prudent simply means wise, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Now, based on the text on the screen, what makes this man wise? And I'm looking for a response. What makes this man wise based on what you see on the screen? A prudent man, a wise man, foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. What makes him wise? All right, somebody says he's foreseeing the evil. Now, let me illustrate. Let's say I'm standing in the middle of the road, and I foresee that a truck is coming to hit me. And I stand there, and then the truck hit me. Am I wise? <laughs> in fact, I might be a little bit more foolish, right? <laughs> so there's something else in the verse that makes the man wise. What else in the verse makes the man wise? That foreseeing is one aspect of it. What's the other aspect? He hideth himself. In other words, there's two things that makes this man wise. He sees trouble coming, and then he does something about it. Are you with me so far? So what's the two things? He sees the evil, but then he does what? He hides himself or does something about it. Just keep that in mind. We're going to come back to this near the end of the presentation. Now, you're going to find that what we're going to share with, with you over this weekend is going to be drastically different than what you're used to hearing. It's going to be a very aggressive program that we're going to share this weekend. And the reason why the program is so aggressive is because disease and sickness is aggressive. Now, if you find that something forceful is coming at you, 
The only way to counter that force is by more force. So because disease is so forceful, then we must counter the diseases of the United States with the same force. So don't expect to hear what you're normally hearing. And why do I say that? Because one of the definitions of insanity is to do the same thing and expect different results. So if there's anyone that has been struggling with any kind of health issues and you've been doing the same thing year after year after year after year, and you find that you have not seen any changes, then it might be time to try something different. And I can promise you that what we're going to share tonight is going to be something different. And if we are wise, then we will not only foresee the evil, but we'll also do something about it or hide ourselves. Now, let me just show you how aggressive sicknesses and diseases are. As you look at the ten, top 10 reasons why people die in America, does anyone know what number one is? Number one is heart disease. Heart disease takes the lives of over 633,842 persons, not over its lifetime, but per year. So every single year in the United States, 633,842 persons die in the U.S. every single year from heart disease alone. That's pretty aggressive, is it not? Now you see why the program that we're sharing with you must also be very, very aggressive. Now, this is only counting the ones that have died, but there's millions in the United States that are actually suffering with heart disease that are still alive. Now, what's also interesting is that I've been tracking these statistics from 2011. And what I found is that every single year, these diseases, well, they do it every three years, so uh, this is 2016 stats, and the one that they did before this was 2013, and in 2013, it was actually 614,000 that were dying every single year. And three years later, the number has not dropped. We see the numbers that have actually risen. So it is actually up almost 20,000 from three years ago, people that are dying every single year of just heart disease alone. That's very aggressive, my brother and sister. Therefore, we need a very aggressive program. What do you say? Does anyone know what number two killer is in the United States? Cancer. You know, when you hear about the top 10 killers in the United States, oftentimes we think about gunslinging and gangbanging and wars and different things of that nature, but you're going to be amazed to know that the majority of the reasons why people expire in the United States is not because of gunshots, it's not because of wars, it's not because of uh, the things that we normally think about, it is actually because of the decisions that we make when we sit at our dinner table. All right, number two, someone mentions is cancer, and we see that cancer and heart disease combined is killing over 1.2 million persons every single year. Just those two diseases alone. And cancer is also up from 2013 by over 4,000. Next in line is chronic lower respiratory disease. Next in line, that's also up almost 8,000. Accidents, uh, then strokes, cardiovascular diseases, up almost over 7,000 as well. Alzheimer's diseases, up 17,000. Diabetes, up 3,000. Uh, flu and pneumonia, also up almost... 2,000. Kidney disease is up almost 2,000 as well. And a lot of people are committing suicide because they're going down into hopeless graves, not knowing that there's a person who cares about our health, our spirituality, and our mentality. So when you add all of these up, you see that there are millions of persons that are dying every single year in the United States. And sadly, a lot of them could have been prevented. So we must share a very aggressive program because the program is very aggressive. Now, what, what must sadden Christ's heart is that he makes us a wonderful promise that we'll share, but yet every single year he sees that people are contracting diabetes. And by the way, diabetes is the number one cause of blindness, number one cause of kidney failure, number one cause of amputation. It has all kinds of complications in addition to the 80,000 that is literally killing. It's not sharing, that statistic doesn't show how much are suffering, how much people have had their toes and their limbs amputated, how many people are having kidney disease and going into dialysis, how many people are losing their eyesight as a result of these diseases. And I, I can imagine Christ looking down and just weeping, seeing that it's people that he loves so much and he has given us a plan are suffering from these preventable illnesses. Then you look at those with heart disease, and Christ is weeping. Looking at those who are suffering with cancer, 
and Christ must be you've been looking at those who are having accidents and all kinds of other diseases that are preventable and I can imagine Christ is looking down and looking at the ones that he loves so much and watching them suffer and I can imagine Christ is weeping now God made a wonderful promise and a wonderful blessing and and, and this is why I share that this is revolutionary for me when I learned this in 29, 2009 that God cares about our entire well-being. Notice what this verse says. This is from 3 John 2. God's desire. What is God's desire for us? Notice what it says. He says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. So God is saying, I wish above everything else that you may prosper and be in health. We should say amen for that, my brothers and sisters. God is saying, I want to see you healthy. God is saying, I want to see you happy. God is saying, I don't want to see you suffering from diabetes. I don't want to see you suffering from cancer. I don't want to see you suffering from all these debilitating diseases. He says, I wish above everything else that you may prosper and be in health. And then he goes on to say, even as thy soul prospers. What is he saying? The same way I want your spirituality to prosper, I want the same exact way for your health to prosper. And how much does God want our, our spirituality to prosper? He says, be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And he says, the same perfection that I want for your spirituality is the same perfection that I want for your health. And I could imagine again, Christ is weeping. Why? Because he loves us so much and he wants to see us in health, but we're making poor dietary choices, poor lifestyle choices, and we're developing diseases that are preventable. Now, that is God's desire. I recently, and, and just to share you the, the burden, I, I had a brief interaction or a brief encounter very recently. My daughter, she developed a rare illness called Kawasaki. Very rare. Only about seven to 20,000 persons in the U.S. ever contracts it. It's a rare disease that could, and they have no known cause whatsoever. And if it's not caused, caught early, it could actually affect the coronary vessels of the heart. Well, praise God, we caught it early. But it was, it was a very trying process. Um, didn't know what was going to happen when we first were diagnosed. We didn't know if the disease had advanced and it would affect our heart. So my wife and I, we were truly burdened at the time. And you know what that gave me a glimpse of? How God feels about us, his children. You know what he says about us? He says, your parents, your mother and your father may forget, but God says, I will never, ever forget you. And as I sat there and watched my daughter suffering, she had a fever of 104 for five days straight. She had a rash all over her body. And as I watched her suffer, you know what I said? I said, Lord, why not me? I would rather bear the burden than to have my daughter suffering. And that's what Christ said. But not only did he say it, that's what he actually did. We're going to talk about that Saturday morning. So we see that I watched my daughter suffer. And because of my love for her, you know what I did? I made sure every step along the way I was there, guiding her back to health. I was there feeding with her. I was there praying with her. I was there, my wife caught the shot, I was there sleeping with her. I made sure that I was with her every moment of her illness, and that shows me, my brothers and sisters, the love that God has for us, no matter what we're going through in life. He's going to be there to guide us. He's going to be there to counsel us. He's going to be, th be there to try to restore our health back to its full fruition. And for my daughter, I did not rest until we were able to have her health fully restored. And that's why God says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. But again, we mentioned that, this, that that is the ideal. And unfortunately, sometimes the ideal and the realities are two totally different things. Let me explain. Let's look at the reality. And our subject this week, our theme is abundant life. And it came from this very verse from John 10, 10. Notice what the Bible says, and these are the words of Christ. Jesus says, The thief cometh not, but for to, what's in the word? Steal, and what else? And to? Kill, and what else? To? Destroy. So he's saying Satan is coming to steal. Satan is coming to kill. Satan is coming to destroy. That is the reality that we're faced with. But Jesus did not stop there. Amen? Christ said, But I have come that you may have life 
But not just to be alive and suffering with these diseases, suffering with cancer and suffering with diabetes and suffering with hypertension and suffering with arthritis and suffering with osteoporosis and suffering with all these diseases. He said, I didn't just come for you to have life, but he says, I've come that you may have life. How? More abundantly. He said, I'm, I'm just not content with you being alive. I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health. And I also desire that instead of you having your life stolen and, and having your life killed and having your life destroyed, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it not just to live, but to have it how? More abundantly. And that's why our seminar is entitled Abundant Life. Now, how is Satan kill, stealing life? You know, I'm amazed at sometimes, especially my, my father-in-law is one of those persons, and you've probably encountered some as well. Sometimes you begin to talk to someone about health, making lifestyle changes, and so on and so forth. And some of the responses that you hear so often, you've, I'm quite sure some of us heard it before, I'm going to die of something anyway. Have you guys heard that before? I'm not going to change my life and eat this and eat that and watch how much exercise and how much water I drink. I'm going to die of something anyway. Have you heard that before? <laughs> My father-in-law kills me. You know, uh, my, my wife's side of the family, her brother, her sister, and her mom, and that's, that's her immediate family, they've all changed their lifestyle, changed their diets, and they have seen the benefits of living a healthy life. But her father, even though he's sick and he's going through so much physically, he just refuses to change his life. And I remember he had a, a short-term um, short uh, desire to, to have health. He actually had an open heart surgery. And at that time, my wife and I, we went and visited him in New York, and we talked with him and prayed with him, tell him to stop some of the habits that he have. And he says, yes, I'll definitely do it. As soon as I get out, I'm going to change my life. And sure, sure enough, he got out. He stopped drinking certain things, stopped doing certain things. And for about maybe a week or two, he was doing excellent. But as soon as that wound began to heal, you know what he did? He went back to doing the very same things that he used to do. And then you ask him about health, and you know what he says? Something is going to kill me anyway. It doesn't make sense for me to make all these changes because I'm going to die of something anyway. Have you heard that before? <laughs> now, I found this to be uh, interesting. When you read the Bible, the Bible does not support that theory. And let me share with you why. This is my beautiful daughter. And the Bible says, and this is, the, by the way, this is the, the first day she was born, which is December 22nd, 2015. But the Bible says, there's a time to be born, right? The Bible also says that there is a time to what? To die. And most of us stop there and we say, well, that means I'm going to die sometime, so therefore I'm going to live my life however I want because I'm going to die of something anyway. But I want you to know something else that the Bible says. This is from the Ecclesiastes now, chapter 7 and verse 17. Notice what the Bible says. It says, Neither be thou foolish. And read the rest of it with me. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? You guys catch that? So what is God saying? He's saying it is possible that you can kill yourself before the time. So when a person says, I'm not going to make any changes because I'm going to die of something anyway, God is saying, neither be thou foolish, why shouldest thou die before thy time? And one of the things that you notice as you look at the top 10 causes of diseases is that the majority of them are preventable. And that's what we're going to share with you this weekend. All right. Dr. Ornish, one of the most quoted health advocates, and he's a wonderful physician who's been drastically changing so many people's lives. One of them is Bill Clinton and many other celebrities, as well as uh, normal people. He's been so influential in changing so many people's lives. And I want you to notice something that he says. He said, think about it. Heart disease and diabetes, which account for more death in the U.S. and worldwide than everything else combined, are completely, what's the next word? Preventable. Then he goes on to say, by making comprehensive, what's those next two words? Lifestyle changes without drugs or surgery. So he's saying you can literally prevent or reverse diabetes. You can literally prevent or reverse high blood pressure. And I've seen it so many times, I'm going to share some testimony, that if you're willing to make some changes, you can actually see that your health could be restored. 
And therein lies the problem. Man does not like change, especially when it comes to the diet. Another well-noted physician, his name is Caldwell Essesine, and they both do a lot of work as far as health advocates in the physician's world. And this is what he says based on his experience. He says, I've noticed that people don't dislike change. What do they dislike? They dislike being changed. <laughs> you guys catch that? So they're not against change as long as that change does not affect them. And therein lies the problem, my brothers and sisters. If we're going to have our health maintained or restored, we must be willing to make some changes. In fact, it's interesting, in the Bible you find something similar. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, we will eat our own bread, we will wear our own apparel, only let me be called by thy name to take away our reproach. They said, Lord, I want to eat what I want to eat, but I want you to take away our reproach. In other words, I'm going to eat the unhealthy foods, but I want you to take away my sickness. And God is saying, no, no, it doesn't work that way. And as we share the wonderful promise that God has for us, as our subject is entitled, None of These Diseases, you're going to see that God's blessings are conditional, based on our choices. Now, John Robbins, who's the president of the Food Revolution Network, he made this statement. He says, if you want to know the value of health, ask someone who lost it. I'm not sure about you, but I've seen so many of my family members and close friends lose their health. And as you see these, uh, my close relatives on their deathbeds, there's nothing they desire more at that moment to have their health restored. My appeal to us is don't let us, our bodies get to that point. A few years back in 2015, I had to fly to Jamaica, and there I had to bury my uncle who died of complications with diabetes. Two years, no, three years before that, I, well, I didn't make that trip, but I had another uncle in Jamaica that died of complications with prostate cancer. So I, 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 I'm not telling you cunningly device fables. This is something that I've come near and dear to my own personal heart. I've seen my loved ones suffer and die from these debilitating diseases. Then the funny thing is when after I buried my uncle who died of complication and diabetes, two months later after I got back to the States, I then had to fly to Hartford, Connecticut, and I had to watch my aunt die of complications to cancer. And what was so sad about this particular one is that she was diagnosed a few years earlier, but she, after she did her chemotherapy and after she did her radiation, she made no lifestyle changes whatsoever. And about two years later, it came back. It came back more aggressive. She was still eating her fried food. She was eating her heavy uh, saturated fats. She was eating all these unhealthy things after she was gone through a treatment and after God gave her a reprieve, she continued the same lifestyle. And then the second go around, unfortunately, I was actually there and watched my aunt take her very last breath. So what am I saying? This is something that I've come very near and dear to my heart. And I'm praying that we don't have to go through this and that we don't have to see our loved ones go through this as well. But I have good news, amen? We have good news. And the good news is this, that as my wife and I have traveled from place to place, we've traveled all over Europe, we've traveled to Canada, we've traveled all over the United States, and as we've done these seminars, one thing that we have seen consistent is that when people follow this program that we're going to share with you these next couple of days, though it seems aggressive, though it seems strange, they have seen the results. Let me just share a few of these testimonies. Now, this is in Ohio. This is a young lady. Her name is Jackie Floyd. And we did a, a similar seminar, what we're going to share this weekend. And she literally made all the changes that we talked about in the seminars that particular weekend. And you can see that she lost a lot of weight in a very short time. This is in 2013, and she continued to lose and lose weight. And this is what she sent to me on Facebook after we left the seminar, and she began to make these changes. And this was actually sent just a few months after we left from doing the seminar in Ohio. Notice what she said. She says, Nolan and Edwards, I'm praying that God, to God that we have another chance to take another picture together. With the ministry I've learned and heard from you and your wife, and most of all the Holy Spirit, my wife, my life has changed, and so has my health, and I thank God for you too. I feel better than I ever have. 
before, I truly have a deep love for the health message to God be the glory. People who are willing to make these changes, they see the results. And I just pulled a recent picture of her yesterday, and this is what she looks like now. What did she do? She simply followed the simple plan that I'm sharing with you this weekend. Let me show you the before again. So that's before. You can see that she was slimming down. And now this is what she looks like right now. Do you see a difference, my brothers and sisters? This message that I'm going to share with you, it makes a difference. Let's look at a few more testimonies. This is our cousin, our cousin Jalisa. Again, she decided that she's going to follow this plan that I'm going to share with you all the way. This is what she looked like originally before she came to us. And this is what she looks like now. It works. And it's not just about losing weight. It's all, a person could be slim and unhealthy. I have an aunt who's very slim that has type 2 diabetes. So slimness doesn't necessarily mean health. Am I making sense? So the plan is, is not just about losing weight. It's about having health of body, health of mind, and health of soul. But you can see she looks excellent. This is another young man. I did a series of meetings in Atlanta. He's actually a member of our church now, and he too has lost 30 pounds. It gets better. We were in Idaho, and this man's name is Lee Pyle. And at that time, I'm, I actually have to check with him now, he actually lost 130 pounds. And his wife at that time, which is about two years ago, I have to check with them to see how they're doing now, but she actually lost 50 pounds. But not only that, she's off of all her high blood pressure medications. What did she do? Simply follow what I'm going to share with you this weekend. So that's why you don't want to miss tomorrow night. You don't want to miss Saturday morning at, uh, at 11. You don't want to miss Saturday afternoon at 3 or 2.30. And you don't want to miss also at 3 o'clock or the 4.30. You want to catch every single one. Are you with me? So we can have these blessings as well. And of course, my parents, my father, was on high blood pressure medications for 18 years. How long? 18 years. And I did this very similar seminar in Florida. My father actually lives in New York slash Massachusetts. He has a job in Massachusetts, but his house is in New York. And my wife and I were living in Atlanta at the time. And I was actually doing a seminar in Florida, and he happened to be with my sister at the time in Florida. He came to those seminars, he, my sister, and many others. And when, what, I share, what I'm going to share with you this weekend, I share the very same thing. And they decided to make those immediate changes. And after going back to his doctor after a month, you know what the doctor says? Whatever you're doing, continue to do it. I'm going to have to lower your medication. Month number two, whatever you're doing, continue to do it. I'm going to have to lower your medication. Month number three, whatever you're doing, continue to do it. I'm going to have to take you completely off of your medication. It's been three years, and my father is off medication, and my mother. None of them are taking any medications whatsoever by simply following the plan that I'm going to share with you this weekend. And lastly, this is my mother-in-law. And this is a photo taken at my wife and I's graduation. This was in 2005, 2006. And my mother-in-law developed breast cancer. And at that moment, she made some changes as well. You can see that she slimmed down. And, you know, when, when a person say that they survived breast cancer, you know what the lifespan is? If you live five years after you've uh, had cancer, then they say that you're a cancer survivor, even if you die, die the sixth year. It's been 13 years and my mother-in-law is still completely cancer-free. What am I saying? I know that what I'm going to share with you works. But remember, and I'm going to continue to refer you to this, a wise man not only foresees the evil, but he hides himself. He does something about it. So for us to come and get all this knowledge that I'm going to share this weekend, if we don't do something about it, it only makes us more foolish. We are that man that's standing, watching the truck comes, the truck hits us, and it makes us more foolish. Let's see the truck and step aside. What do you say? All right. Now, William Lee, MD, says, can we eat to starve cancer? Yes, we can. What we choose to eat three times a day can be our chemotherapy. Doctors are wising up, my friends on the simple things that we can do that can restore our health. Now, Thomas Edison once said, the doctor of the future will give little medicine, but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and the prevention of disease. So he said the doctors of the future, as they get more knowledge and as they get more wisdom, he said they'll give little medicine, but they'll begin to instruct 
and they'll begin to guide their patients in the care of the human frame. They'll learn about diet. They'll teach their patients about the cause, and they also teach their patients about the prevention of disease. That's what Dr. Thomas Edison says the doctors of the future will do. Have it happened? Unfortunately not. It's happening now. We see it more and more. But for many years, this was a dark spot in our medical field. So what's his counsel followed? Dr. Ray Strand. He actually enlight got enlightened. And notice what he said. And by the way, I don't want to give the, the impression that I'm against doctors. And I don't want to give the impression that anyone should leave here and just stop taking their medication. I just want to make that very clear. If, if you're clear on that, say amen. Now, what I'm sharing with you is that the information will help you to be more intelligent and teach you how to speak to your doctor more intelligently, one. And then two, as you make these changes, your body will tell your doctor that it's time to come off of the medication. So I did not tell my father to stop taking his uh, whatever drugs he was taking for high blood pressure, uh, Lipitor, whatever it is. I, I, I simply told him, make these changes. And I noticed, notice what I said? Month, doc, month one, his body told his doctor, lower the medication. Month two, his body told the doctor to lower the medication. Month three, his body told the doctor to take him off the medication. I didn't tell him to come off medication. That's, that's, that's unwise. And if you just go home and stop taking medication, that's also unwise. Let your body tell your doctor to take you off of the medication. And also learn how to speak more intelligently to your doctor. Those are the goals that will help you to accomplish this weekend. Is that clear to everyone? All right, good. All right. So he wrote a few books, Dr. Ray Strand, Health, Healthy for Life. He also wrote, What Your Doctor Doesn't Know About Nutritional Medicine May Be Killing You. And he also wrote another one called Death by Prescription. Now, he was a regular MD, and he saw that whatever he was doing wasn't the most beneficial to his patients, so he restudied some things. He learned more about nutrition, and then he kind of changed up the way he practices. And this is what he wrote in the book, Death by Prescription. Notice what he said. He said... Uh, Dr. Ray Strand, MD, states in his book, Death by Prescription, he says, in medical school, medical school, I had not received any significant instruction on the subject. The subject is nutrition. He said, I didn't receive any instruction on nutrition. I was not alone. He says, only approximately 6% of the graduating physicians in the U.S. have any training in nutrition. So the doctors that are graduating, only 6% of them take any nutrition classes whatsoever. But then notice, he says medical students may take elective course on a to topic, but few actually do. The education of most physicians is disease-oriented with a heavy emphasis on pharmaceuticals. We learn about drugs and why and when to use them. So he's saying we haven't learned to tell a person that you must increase this amount of nutrients in your diet. We haven't learned how to tell a person that they must adjust their nutritional uh, buildup. He said the only thing we learned is if they stub their toe, or write a prescription. If they come with any kind of malady whatsoever, we don't look at the solution. We just simply write a prescription. That's what he said we learned. Now, what has been the result of that? Notice, which drug causes the most deaths according to the DEA? Which one do you think, cocaine, heroin, or prescription? It's actually prescription. And this, is what the, and this is the danger of just being medication, medication, medication without education. We don't want to just have medication. We also want to have what? Education. The DA says there are more people dying from prescription opiates than cocaine and heroin combined. So in the U.S., and this is based on 2011 stats, 63,000 persons died from complications of medication. 63,000 people in 2011. And I mentioned, and I'm going to show you that these numbers are actually increasing year after year after year. So prescription, opioid overdoses, this has become a national crisis in the U.S. It's literally a crisis. Every day more than 115 Americans die after overdosing from opioids. The misuse of addiction of opioids including prescription, pain relievers, heroin, and sympathetic, uh, synthetic opioids such as phenethyl is a serious national crisis that affects public health as well as social and econo economic welfare. And this is actually from the, go the, the government website, which is drugabuse.gov. And they're saying we are in a crisis with medication. We're living in a crisis. 
and we're going to skip through some of these for the sake of time, but roughly 29 to 20, 21 to 29% of patients prescribed opioids for chronic pain misuse them. And about 80% of people who use heroin first misuse prescription opioids. And by the way, I work in a clinic as a medical assistant, so I literally see these things taking place right before my eyes. Then you can see that since 2000, going all the way up to 2015, you can see that the increase of drugs is literally consistent every single year to the point now where the government is saying we are in a crisis and you know what the government has done they have cut back and they have tightened their regulations in all of the clinics I work in a clinic and to prescribe an opioid and a certain drug is very very intensive process you have to go through government websites and so on and so forth but people are irrespective of all of that you can see that drugs are still on the rise still on the rise and by the way the United States is the most medicated country in the entire world by far not even close the second country which is Canada is at 30,000 and the US is at 50,000 as far as per million persons that are on these heavy heavy drugs so we see that we're in a drug crisis and the doctors are catching on to these he says the cause of most disease is the poisonous drugs physicians who persistently give in order to effect a cure so while we must do what we must do to begin with we want to begin to educate ourselves and make some changes that we too, by God's grace, if we're on drugs, can come off, and if we're not on drugs, that we can stay off. What do you say? Amen? All right, now, the problem that we're facing now is that we're in a cycle. And what's the cycle? We eat unhealthy foods, which sends us to the doctor. The doctor sends us to the pharmaceutical. And then we're caught up in this visceral cycle. McDonald's and Burger King and all these fast food chains. We're eating these unhealthy foods and some of these foods at home. It causes a sickness. Then we go to the doctor. Then the doctor sends us to the pharmacy. And guess what? The food industry, billion dollar industry. The medical industry, trillion dollar industry. And then the pharmaceutical companies are also billion if not trillion dollar industry. All at the expense of our health. And we can simply make some changes. We can simply make some changes. So we see that we are in the cycle. We need to break the cycle. But praise God, he has a wonderful promise for us. Amen? And our subject tonight is entitled, None of These Diseases. Watch God's promise. And I thank God so much that he cares not just about our spirituality, but he cares about our physicality. Notice what God said. This is a beautiful promise, and I want all of us to claim this promise tonight. What do you say? Notice what God says. What does God promise to the Israelites and us? Let's read this all together, if you can, read it with me. And it and said, if, together, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put how many? None of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. Why? For I am the Lord that healeth thee. This is a wonderful promise, my brothers and sisters. God says, those Israelites, they had certain diseases. And I'm making you a promise that whatever they have, if you will listen to what I say, if you will obey my statutes, and we're going to share what these statutes are, God says, I will make you a promise. I will not allow you to have those diseases that the Egyptians had. Why? Because I am the, the God that does what? That healeth thee. So the question that we'll ask ourselves now is, what diseases did the Egyptians have? Is that a good question? Because he made us a promise that he will not give us whatever disease they had, so we need to first and foremost know what diseases did they have. Point number two, we need to know how did they get them? Because if we know what they had, and we know how they got them, then we know what we don't want to have and what we shouldn't do. <laughs> Am I making sense? <laughs> So we need to know what they had and how did they get them. So let's begin to take a biblical journey to find out what diseases did these Egyptians have and how did they get them. Again, our subject tonight is this wonderful promise that God has made to us that I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians. Now, let's find out. Now, Dr. Rosalie David, she did, uh, which is a paleopathologist, she did some research and she did some research on mummies and found out what disease the Egyptians had and how did they get them? Let's find out some of the disease that she found. It's hard to see it here, 
let me just summarize it for you. Uh, well, I'm going to come back to her. Uh, Na National Geographic, they did similar research and they found the same thing. I'll come back to Dr. Rosalie David's research, which is pretty much the same. So in eight mummy findings revealing ancient disease, notice what it says, CT scans, MRIs, and DNA tests are offering intriguing insights into how people lived and died long ago. A 2011 study, 52 mummies in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo showed that almost half had, what did they have? Clogged arteries. What does clogged arteries lead to? Heart disease. Strokes. This kind of condition that can lead to a heart attack or stroke, as it turns out, these ancient Egyptians were not alone. Recent CT and uh, CT scans of 137 mummies from four different regions spanning from more than 4,000 years revealed that one-third had what? Clogged arteries. So we can begin to see that the Egyptians had the same thing that we have now. And God is saying, if the Egyptians had heart disease, I'm going to make you a promise. I will not allow you to have heart disease, which the Egyptians had. Praise God. Amen? We can claim that promise. God is saying, whatever they had, you don't have to have it. Now, again, the experts are stumped by the new mummy studies uh, God is thinking. What else have we learned about the history of disease from ancient human remains? Notice, this is what they concluded. And I just extracted these and put them in the slides. Heart disease. So based on a study of the mummies in Egypt and then also four different regions of the world, they found very consistent is that they all were consistently having heart disease. God says, I'll put none of these diseases upon you, which I brought upon the Egyptians. Also found that they were having strokes, malaria, cancer, cirrhosis, which is a liver disease, smallpox, lung infection, which is lower respiratory disease. And you notice that already we see heart disease, stroke, uh, and uh, lung infection and cancer, they are all a part of the top 10 reasons why people die in America. We live in America, and God is saying, I'm making you a promise that I'll put none of the diseases which are brought up in Egyptians upon you, but notice that God gave a condition. He says, if you will diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, then God made this promise, and keep all his statutes. How many? So we need to know what the statutes are. Then he makes a promise, I will put none of these diseases upon you which are brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. So now we see that they also had tuberculosis, they also had leprosy, dietary deficiency, and also tooth decay. So this is based on uh, National Geographic's research on the mummies. Now, the question then is, what were the lifestyle of the Egyptians? So we, we said we want to find out two things. Does anyone remember the first thing we want to find out? We wanted to find out what disease they had. We found that out, right? Next thing we wanted to find out is what? How did they get them? And we want to find out these th two things for two reasons. One, we want to know what we don't want to get. Then we also know, want to find out what we don't want to do. So whatever I'm going to put up now, the lifestyle of the Egyptians, we want to make sure that we don't do it because that's what led to them having these diseases. So what were the lifestyle of the Egyptians? We found that they had a high-fat diet. What else did they have? They also had a high-protein diet. This is based on archaeological and scientific research. They also had a low-fiber diet. They also had a low-in-nutrient diet. Now, remember, these are things that we don't want to do because this is what led the Egyptians to have the disease that they had. So if we're going to claim God's promise, that, we mean, we, that means we must keep all his statues, and then we can claim the promise. They also had a little or no exercise lifestyle. In other words, they had the Israelite slaves, and the Israelites did all the manual labor for them, and they just sat down, and they had the, 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 they had their, uh, the flies being swatted away, and people would just bring their dinner, and they just sat there and ate and ate and ate, and as a result of their high fat, high protein, low fiber, low nutrients, and no exercise, we see that they had heart disease. We see that they had cancer. We see that they had chronic low respiratory disease. We see that they had uh, uh, strokes and all these other diseases, the same things that we're having today. And the reason why so many people in the U.S. have these same diseases is because they have adapted the same lifestyle. And remember, to do the same thing and expect different results, 
is the definition of insanity. Now, as a result of what they sowed, they also reaped. The Egyptians sowed the seeds of disease, therefore they reaped the harvest of disease. The Bible says, be not deceived, God is not mocked, that which a man sows he shall also reap. So because whatever you put in the ground, you expect to get back, but not only get back the same thing, you get back more abundance. So if we are sowing the seeds of disease, the harvest will come. But praise God, if we are sowing the seeds of health, health will come. Amen? All right, now, let's move forward. So, as a result of the Egyptian connection, we see that they had heart disease. We see that they had cancer. We see that they had diabetes. We see that they had arthritis. We see that they had high blood pressure. We see that they had tuberculosis. We see that they had obesity, and they also had sexually transmitted diseases. This is based on Dr. Rosalie David's research, which pretty much looks like the same thing that we have been right now in the United States. Now, after God made that warning to the, to, to the Israelites, I'll put none of these diseases upon you, then he got a little bit more specific. Notice what God said. This is in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28. He says, but it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken. God says, if you will not listen, if you will hear about how to regain health, and if you don't listen, he says, to the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and do all his commandments and statutes, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. So the, what is the curses? When you look up the word curses in the Bible, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, you know what that word curses means? It means weakness, sickness, and disease. So God says, if you're not going to listen, I'm a mighty and powerful God, but I respect your choices. If you want to sow disease, you're going to reap disease. So he says, you receive these curses. Now, what are these curses? The curses are, God says, if you don't listen, You'll be smitten with consumption. You'll be smitten with fever. You'll be smitten with inflammation. You'll be smitten with extreme burning. You'll be smitten with this blasting. You'll be smitten with mildew. And God says you'll be smitten with the botch and the emeralds and the scab and the itch. God is saying, if you don't listen, these are the things that's going to happen. And when you translate these, madness, blindness, astonishment of heart, when you translate these, you know what it is? The very same thing that scientific research now concluded. That, God, through the, uh, that Moses, through the inspiration of God, wrote over 3,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago. These things were written so long ago, but yet scientific research, Dr. Rosalie David and National Geographics and all these other scientific researchers, they're now coming to the same exact conclusion that God had written through Moses 3,000 years ago. So we see that they're now catching up. So what are these diseases that the Bible mentioned? Consumption. When you look it up, it means tuberculosis and emphysema. What, what about fever? When you look up fever, chills, shivering, and fits. When you look up inflammation, it has anything that has the word itis means inflammation. So we see arthritis, bronchitis. All these itis are just simply inflammatory diseases. And God said many years ago, if you're not listening to my counsel, these are what the Egyptians have, and you're going to get the same thing. 3,000 years later, we're now coming to what God said. God had it right there in his word. Amen? Botch, chicken pox and hives, emeralds, when you translate that, tumors, tuberculosis, I mean tumors, hemorrhoids, and cancer. And then he says astonishment of heart means heart attack, strokes, hypertension, and all other cardiovascular diseases. God said many years ago that these things would come about. And now we see that diseases are prevalent all over the United States, but I tell you, my brothers and sisters, we can still claim the promise tonight. Amen? Now, the question then is, what is disease? Because once you find out what disease is, then you can get the solution. The best de definition of, that I find of disease is found in a wonderful book called Ministry of Healing. And notice what it says. Disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. So when does disease come? When these laws of health are violated. Now when God says... If thou wilt diligently hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God and do that which is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, those statutes are actually laws of health that God had given to the Israelites while they were traversing on their way to the promised land. So these eight laws of health, we're going to find as we go through this weekend that they're directly tied in the Bible. In fact, we're going to look at it briefly tonight. They're literally in the Bible, and God says, I make your promise, do these laws. 
And disease only comes when there's an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from laws being violated. So the question then is, what are these laws? And these laws are very simple. Very simple. God's plan is so simple. Trust it in God. Godly trust. Take away the stress and the depression and the anxiety. Godly trust. Then there's open air. There's daily exercise. Sunshine. Proper rest. Lots of water. Temperance. And also nutrition. And you notice that all of these are found in the first two books of the Bible. And this is what God gave to Adam and Eve. When God made man, he knew what he needed. So right there, God gave man the ability to trust him. God gave man fresh air. God gave man a level of exercise that he must do, daily exercise, not just exercise once a month or once a week or once a year, daily exercise. God says, get some sun sun. Make sure you're getting adequate rest. Drink a lot of water. Make sure you're temperate. You're eating only the good things in moderation and you're staying away from all things that are bad for the body. And then God says, I want to also give you proper kind of nutrition. And when a man does this, they begin to see their health restored. We share it more. And notice, thy hands of fashion they made me, give me understanding, and I shall keep thy commandments. Now, question is this. Is disease a friend or a foe? Let me do it this way. If you say disease is a friend, let me see your hand. All right, we have some brave people holding up their hands. All right, let any, anyone else? Anyone that says disease a friend, let me see your hands. All right, good. Anyone that says disease is a foe, let me see your hands. <laughs> Did I see the same hands go up twice in the back? <laughs> anyone that says I have no idea, let me see your hands. <laughs> All right. Let me ask it this way. Does anyone know what this is, by the way? This is a tornado alarm. Is this a friend or a foe? Let me see the hands of those that said it's a friend. All right, now, next question is this. Does a tornado warning give you good news? If I hear that my house and my life might be totally destroyed, that's not good news, right? But at the same time, it is good news, <laughs> right? Am I making sense? So it's good news that I now have the opportunity to escape even though it's not necessarily good news. Sounds confusing, but I think you understand what I'm saying, right? <laughs> so it's good news but at the same time, it's not good news. All right. So we see that a tornado warning is definitely a friend. I'm going to skip through these for the sake of time. Um, let me just skip through these. Now, a check engine light, is it good or is it bad? Friend or foe? Somebody's getting wiser. Amen. Praise God. You keep coming, you get more wisdom as you're here. Amen. <laughs> All right. Why is it a friend? All right. And why is it not good news? That's right. But we're thankful for it, right? So even though it's not giving us good news, we like the fact that it's giving us advanced warning so that we can do something about it. Am I making sense? Most people, you know what they do? Not necessarily with the car, but they do it with their bodies. They put out the check engine light. When you check the check engine light, you know what it does? It gets you to the source. You hook up the, you, you know, you hook up that, um, that, that, that diagnostic, diagnostic machine, and it will say your alternator is bad. Or it might say you have a misfire. Or it might say, uh, you know, change one of your plugs. It, it, it gives you specific information. It gets to the source. And once you get to the source, then the issue has been solved. Disease is the same thing. Disease is actually a friend. Let me tell you why. Our bodies have what's called an immune system. 
Every single day we come in contact with bacteria, we come in contact with viruses, we come in contact with all kinds of pathogens. And if we didn't have an immune system, those simple bacteria and viruses that we touch on a doorknob and we shake each other's hand, it would literally take our lives, as simple as it may seem. But because we have an immune system, we don't even notice that we're coming in contact with bacteria and viruses and these other pathogens because our immune system sees it, destroys it, and we just carry on as business as usual. Now, what happens with disease is that the immune system has been weakened or defeated, and then the body says, you know what, let me send a trigger to let them know that we're being defeated right now so that they could do something about it. Does that make sense to you? So disease is like the check engine light. It's sending a message saying that there's something going on. Let me manifest myself to show them some kind of ex something externally so they could see something that what is taking place internally. Because we don't see what's taking place in our bodies, right? We don't see that our immune system is weakened. But our immune system says, because we're being weakened right now, let me send a trigger in a rash. Let me send a trigger in a cough. Let me send a trigger in a runny nose. Let me send a, some kind of trigger so that they know externally what's taking place internally so that now we can do something about it. Same thing as the check engine light. So disease is a friend that's not giving you good news. But it is giving you good news. Am I making sense? All right. Now, how does disease work? And I'm going to speed through for the sake of time. How does disease work? When a person is coughing, you know what that is? That is an effort. Now, remember, disease is an effort of nature. That is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that resulted from a violation of the laws of health. So because we have not been getting enough exercise, because we have not been drinking enough water, because we have not been getting enough sunlight, because we have not been eating proper nutrients, the body is saying, I am now being suppressed on my immune system. Therefore, something is taking place. Let me try to expel this impurity. So disease is in an effort of nature to free the system. So coughing, that means there's bacteria in there, and a coughing is saying, getting rid of that bacteria. Same thing with sneezing and runny nose. When your nose is runny and you're sneezing, that means there's something going on and your body's naturally trying to get rid of the bacteria or whatever is taking place inside the body. Same thing with a fever. The body knows that this bacteria or this virus can live at 99 or 100. So the body says, let me do something to get rid of this disease. And you know what the body does? It says, let me get a fever of 100. That's not working, let me go up to 101. That's not working, let me go up to 102. Now, after 102, it becomes dangerous. That means that bacteria is so overwhelming, you need to now step in and do something about it. But a fever is actually a natural reaction of the body to get rid of that disease. Does that make sense? So the runny nose and a coughing and a sneezing and a fever, these are efforts of nature to free the system from conditions that resulted because we have not been keeping those laws of health. Now what most people do is they put out the check engine light. You know what they do? They take a cough suppressant, which means we're suppressing the bacteria in our bodies because our body's trying to get rid of it by the reaction of coughing. When you have a bacteria, our body's naturally trying to get rid of it, so it says, let me give a runny nose so that the, the, the bacteria can run out of the body. Those are efforts of nature. Make sense so far? Now, all of the above are efforts of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the law of health. Now, the problem that you find is that a lot of people are mopping the floor while the water is still running. If you go to your house and you see water rushing out of your house, if you're intelligent, you wouldn't just start mopping, right? It would be good for exercise, because <laughs> you'd be mopping for a very long time, but it would not be good at stopping the leak. So the first thing that we want to do is find out what? What is the source of the leak? Am I making sense? It's the same thing with our bodies. So when we get the runny nose, when we get the cough, when we get the fever, when we get any kind of illness, the first thing that we want to find out, what is the source of it? If we just begin to take medication or just begin to take herbs without getting to the source, we're simply mopping the floors and the faucet is still running. We need to get to the source because we're going to show you that the cure is in the cause. All right. The cure is in the cause. 
and I'm going to skip through some of these for the sake of time. I'm already past my time, so let me just wrap up with these four quick points. So let me just summarize. In case of sickness, it gives four steps. The cause should be ascertained, unhelpful conditions should be changed, wrong habits corrected, then nature is to be assisted in her efforts to expel impurities and to reestablish right conditions in the system. So it gives four steps when a disease comes about. The first thing is, what caused it? Number two we want to know is, what are the conditions that caused it? Then we want to know, what habits can we correct based on what caused it? And then now we want to assist nature. Let me illustrate. Now, let's say, ascertain the cause, find out the cause. The Bible actually talks about that as well. But let's say a person has a disease as a result of his environment. Let's say a person gets tuberculosis or a person gets some kind of low respiratory disease because they are working in an environment that had these chemtrails or whatever the case is, gets it into their lungs and is causing a, a disease. Is the solution just to take some medication or some herbs or anything just to get rid to, you know, to continue to fight against it while you're still living in that environment? No. You know what we're doing? We're mopping the floor while the faucet is running. So what do we need to do after we find a cause? We need to change that unhealthful condition. That means we might have to change our environment, change our address to get out of the environment where the disease is so permeating. Let me give another example. Let's say a person develops lung cancer as a result of smoking. Is the solution to say, you know what, I'm going to take some chemotherapy I'm going to take some radiation and I'm going to take, or I'm going to take some herbs or some remedies so that I can continue smoking. Is that the solution? No. What is he doing? He's mopping the floor while the faucet is still running. So in, the, in that case, we need to correct the habit by getting rid of the smoking or getting out of the environment that caused the disease to begin with. Am I making sense? Now, after you've done these three, after you find out the cause, after you've changed unhelpful conditions, after you have correct wrong habits, then now you assist nature. Then you will do the herbs and the remedies and the hydrotherapies and the different efforts of nature, uh, or the different assisting nature to expel impurities and to reestablish right conditions in the system. So step number four is to assist nature. So, in other words, we must reason from cause to effect. So as we look at a person, if a person has heart disease, what's the first thing that we must ask ourselves? Let's see if you're listening to me. I like to teach. Amen? If a person has heart disease, what's the first question that we should ask ourselves? What caused it? Right? It's that simple. And listen, remember, the cure is in the cause. Once you find the cause, you stop it, then you make those changes, and then as a result, the cure will come because you have now found the cause. If a person has cancer, or if a person has a stroke, or if a person has diabetes, what's the first thing we should ask ourselves? What causes it? And then we find that the cure is in a cause. And that means we have to make some, what's the word I'm looking for? Changes. Because to do the same thing and to expect different results is insanity. All right, let me close out. So God wants to address the whole man, mental, physical, and spiritual. And tomorrow we look at this some more. We're going to show God's plan, what he did with these Israelites. And if, if, I'll just share this very briefly, and then we'll close on this point. So what God did with those Israelites, and notice, by the way, that there was over 2 million people, 600 besides women and children. And I want you to notice what the Bible says in Psalm 105, verse 37. When, God, when they were under God's guidance, and they were keeping all his statutes and giving ear to his commandments, the Bible says that there was not one feeble person among their tribes, too many persons under God's care, and not one of them were sick, my brothers and sisters. Isn't this beautiful? What did God do? Well, you remember, they came out of Egypt, and the first thing that they ran into was some bitter waters. Do you guys remember that? Now, the question is this. Did God know that the water was bitter before they got there? So why did he sweeten the water before they got there? You know what he said? I want you to trust me. 
So they entrusted themselves in God's hand. God says, I want you to trust me. And then, you know what God did next? He had them walking around outside. They were sleeping at night. They were getting their exercise. They were getting their open air. They were getting their proper nutrients. You see that God changed their diet. And God taught them the lessons of temperance. So what am I saying? God wants this promise for all of us. If we will hearken to what God says, continue to come. We're going to share more depth tomorrow and then more depth the next day. If we're willing to listen, you can prevent yourself from getting diseases or you can reverse diseases if you have contracted one. God wants us all to claim this promise that he'll put none of these diseases upon us by simply following his plan, godly trust, open air, daily exercise, sunlight, proper rest, and lots of water. Health is a choice and not a chance. God's plan is a decided change. Now I'll close with what I open with. A wise man, if we're wise, we not just we don't just foresee the evil, we'll also hide ourselves. What we began to show you tonight is that we're seeing the causes. We're seeing what causes these sickness. We're seeing what causes these illnesses. But that alone does not make us wise by just seeing what causes it. It actually makes us more foolish if we don't do something about it. What makes us wise is when we see it and then we do something about it. Amen?